Something that my clients have found that's really important is connecting with other people who stutter. A lot of times when kids feel like they're damaged goods or any of those negative feelings, it's because they've never met somebody who stutters or maybe they know about a celebrity, but that feels kind of far in the atmosphere. Welcome to Some Stutter Law, a podcast by the, N- the Newfoundland Laboratory Stuttering Association C- Collaborative. Some Stutter Law is Newfoundland and Labrador's first podcast about living with speech and language disorders. We speak directly to people living with speech and language disorders and others such as speech language pathologists, researchers, educators, and family members. We use inclusive language and themes to help rebuild confidence and hope by dismantling myths, stigma, stereotypes, and barriers. My name is Greg O'Grady, and I'm a person who stutters and a co-host of Some Stutter Law, Newfoundland Labrador's first podcast about communication disorders, along with my co-host. And I'm Caitlin Mayo. I'm a speech-language pathology student, and I'm Greg's co-host on this podcast. Some Stutter Law mission is dismantling and rebuilding stuttering. Let's start listening. Some Stutter Law mandate is in the spirit of Newfoundland Labrador humor, robust, and frank interactive discussions. Some Stutter Law podcast aims to rebuild confidence and hope for today's and tomorrow's persons who live with speech, language, and, and or communication barriers by dismantling stuttering myths, stigmas, stereotypes, and barriers. The objectives of Some Stutter Law podcast are raising awareness, education, understanding, and acceptance of stuttering and communication disorders within our province by providing support, current information, research, and resources. Raising awareness that communication communication disorders are a quality of life issue. Throughout life, stuttering and other communication impairments can impact a person's life emotionally, educationally, physically, socially, and vocationally. Some Stutter Love podcast is a safe space where guests can be themselves without fear of being judged. Today, Some Stutter Law welcomes Martha Horrox, and Martha is living in is a Maine based speech language pathologist. She's the owner of Martha Speech and Stuttering Therapy, a private practice providing speech lang- language t- teletherapy for school aged children. Martha is passionate about stuttering and shares the latest research, treatment ideas, and resources with people who stutter. Speech language pathologists, educators, and parents on her Instagram page at Martha on the line speech. Martha also specializes in teletherapy and creates interactive digital activities to support therapy sessions. Prior to becoming a speech language pathologist, Martha received two other uh, uh, two, two other masters of education, uh, degrees in elementary education and special education, and worked as a special educator. So, so welcome, 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 Martha, to some sort of law podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, uh, Mar- you know, Martha, would you know, would, you know, would you share with our listeners a little bit about your your history, how how you know how how you became uh, involved with stuttering and and therapy? Sure. Well, so I'm a speech language pathologist, and I had never worked with. Um, I was a teacher before. I never had any kids in my class that stuttered. Um, But when I became a speech language pathologist, I started out in the schools and I worked in a huge school and there happened to be a fair amount of children who stutter and it was awesome. I learned so much from them and was really inspired to learn more. I realized that I didn't really know much about stuttering. I had had 
training in my graduate school program. But when I was sitting in front of the kids in the school, I realized I, I didn't really know what to do. And I didn't know a lot about stuttering. And so it really motivated me to learn more. Um, and as I learned, I shared on my page that you mentioned on Instagram and also got the opportunity to meet other speech therapists that were interested in stuttering, other um, speech therapists who realized they also didn't know a lot about stuttering. And so it became sort of this big experience where I was learning from my students, learning from the community, meeting people who stuttered who are adults, um, who gave me a lot of insight. And so it's sort of taken off from there. And I decided to open my own practice here in Maine. I do work with kids that have other communication needs, but stuttering is still my favorite. Martha, I, 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 I know, you know, notice on your, your, your website that uh, Martha Speech Stuttering Therapy is a neurodiversity affirming practice that is accepting and affirming of neurological differences and divergencies. Well, you know, for a lay person who stutters, you know, would, you, would, would you be able to, to, to explain that? Sure. Well, so what that means is that there's a huge movement going on, um, particularly with the autistic population, about neurodiversity. And really what it means is thinking about disability as a difference. It means thinking about communication as the need instead of coming in and, and worrying about fluency or focusing on fluency, making sure that you are identifying what the, the person's needs are, that you're honoring them as a person and as their identity um, and the differences that they bring and not trying to change those things. I think that's the biggest theme is not trying to change anyone, but just to help them better express the what who they are and what they identify with. So the neurodiversity, I think, is really just a term for saying that you're accepting that people are different, that there are inherent differences between people, and then how can they be the best version of themselves with that difference? Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Marcia. And uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I also came across one of your brochures, which you talk about tox, a tox, a to, a toxic positivity. No, uh, no, I've never heard that before. To, toxic positivity. Would, 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 you know, would you like to share a little bit about that? Sure. Well, so I've been working on, um, for the last couple months, I've been working on a new workbook um, about positive stuttering identity. So toxic positivity kind of goes hand in hand, but um, around this idea that you can have positive, healthy, positive feelings about yourself and be someone who stutters. And toxic positivity, I think we've all sort of had moments where somebody has said to us like, oh, it's not that bad. Or, um, oh, everybody stutters. Or, and kind of it, what it does is it's positive, but it doesn't really make you feel good because it doesn't affirm your actual experience and you don't get to share what your challenges are and the emotions that you might be facing. And so then the amount of positivity actually is kind of toxic it what it does instead of empower you is it sort of makes you feel guilty like well if everyone stutters how come I don't hear it all the time or if you know it's not that bad but I feel bad about my experience so there's a lot of sort of shame and guilt that comes out of really overt positivity that doesn't allow for you to embrace your emotions and how you're feeling so a healthier version of positivity would be thinking about honoring those emotions. I'm having a really hard day with my communication. I feel really frustrated about the fact that it's hard to say my name. I, I feel whatever, whatever the emotion is and affirming that, yes, those moments are hard. Um, and 
making sure that then you use those moments to think about, and what can I do? What can I do with them? Can I, next time, can I use a strategy? Can I self-advocate? Can I disclose? And start building a future optimism out of this moment is hard. Here's what I'm going to do about it. Um, and then going from there, instead of saying like, oh, I'm just going to brush it under the rug. Like everybody has hard days. That doesn't really get to the real, the real issue that people are feeling. Um, and it doesn't really address the pain. I think there's a lot of pain and suffering and in, in stuttering. Um, my clients all the time describe moments that are challenging at school or um, with their families. And so acknowledging that, yes, there are painful moments and there are hard moments and then figuring out where to go from there, but never feeling like we're going to brush those under the rug or that you're not your experiences are not being heard. That's that's sort of what I think of when I think of toxic positivity. Um, Martha, when you know, you know, like uh, as you know, as you know, as you were. Many, you know, many people who stutter, you know, try, you know, try desperately to to hide hide our stutter, and and uh, for you, you know, years, you know, years, you know, years, you know, years, you know, years and years, you know, you know, I I I I I could be easily classify myself, or or I have classified myself as a covert person who stutters. Do you, do you feel that you know when you know when a person you know when a person who stutters uh, uh, relates you know relates to their family? Do you think there there you know there, there still is this pressure for a person who stutters to hide their their, their stuttering from the family? And, and does you know does that sort of you know, does that does that affect a person who stutters identity? Do you think there's a relationship here? Oh yes. I, th I think there's there's been a bunch of research that has talked about the effect of um, stigma, but also this this need to hide your stutter and how if you have experienced stigma, so stigma would be like um, if someone is sort of discriminates against you or demonstrates bias against you, so it gives you some negative feedback about your stuttering. Um, that people who stutter often internalize that. And then the, the result might be to be covert. Um, that may be one, we will call them like a stigmatizing behavior. So the stigma leads to internalized stigma. So feeling badly about yourself, feeling uh, negatively about yourself, and then in turn leads to a behavior. So maybe you're covert, maybe you um, add maybe you have some success with um, tensing your hands when you talk. And so that becomes a, a repetitive motion that you do when you're trying to speak. There's all kinds of different stigmatizing behaviors that people develop as they're trying to communicate. Um, and so one really important aspect of speech therapy is, is recognizing what the the stigmatizing behaviors for people are, um, and seeing how you can support those. So, um, yes, I think I still see kids who the parents say, gosh, you know, he, he doesn't stutter at home. And the child says, well, I'm, I try not to, um, and thinking about where, what feedback has the child gotten? Not necessarily that the parent, wants the child to feel badly about stuttering but what kind of feedback has the child gotten about whether stuttering is is acceptable in the home um, maybe every time they stutter the parent looks really worried and so they don't want to stutter because they don't want to make their parent worried so there's still a lot of covert behaviors happening just to make stuttering okay um, and a lot of what i do um, and talk about is if stuttering is okay in your home, then there's not a need for covert stuttering. Um, if stuttering is a part of our society, then then we don't need to be, we don't need to have people be covert there either. So there's there's sort of two 
two goals when I think about speech therapy, which is working with the child, but then also considering their community. Are their parents um, are their parents on board with stuttering? Is it welcome and is it accepted? Um, are there things that maybe the community is doing that makes the child feel like they still need to be covert at home? You know, uh, how would you know? Would you know? Would you know? Would you know? Would you uh, like uh, like encourage a parent to really sit down with you know with you know with you know with their child that that, that stutters to really sort of uh, re, you know re, you know reinforce to, to the child it's okay to to stutter but 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 you know but you know, but most you know, most importantly just just encourage the, 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 the child to open up as you were saying just to say i'm experiencing this you know and so on and so forth you know what would you be the uh, what approach would you take with the parents yeah so it, it, exactly so i would encourage parents to stuttering is is i think especially in speech therapy there was a belief for a long time that if you talked about stuttering that it would be worse and research has found that that's not true in fact talking about starting kind of takes the pressure off. So parents shouldn't feel like they can't talk about stuttering. It, if anything, it really helps to affirm the child. Like I see your experience. I know I, I want to know more about what you're going through and that's really empowering for kids. Um, so talking openly about stuttering is something I talk with parents about a lot. Um, affirming their emotions like we talked about asking um parents will always say my child's so frustrated what can i do when they're frustrated and i always say well you could just ask them how can i help um you don't have to always be the fixer there's not always a fix sometimes the fix is just saying i'm frustrated and just letting that emotion go um but sometimes kids will say you know give me a little space or maybe I need to take a break or can I listen to some music? Sometimes kids already know how to regulate um, themselves when they're, when they're feeling really frustrated. I think also there is a lot of, um, we we're talking about stigma earlier, a lot of stigma in the language that we use to describe stuttering. So um, parents might say, oh, like, I noticed your speech problem today, or um, I noticed that you're trouble ha having trouble talking. And something that I talk to parents about is that stuttering isn't a speech problem. It's just the way that your child talks. Um, it's not that they're having trouble talking, they're just communicating. Stuttering is a form of communication um, and sort of shifting the mindset to being something that is more, um, more supportive, more aware, and so that the child feels um, affirmed in, in their identity. Um, it doesn't mean that you're saying that there's nothing that they can do or there's nothing that, that um, there's nothing for them to work on. I think you can still work on stuttering and say, it's okay to stutter. Stuttering is the way that you communicate. I think you can have a balance of both. Um, and so I think it's important to, um, like I said, to affirm that it's okay to stutter, to um, <clears throat> identify emotions with your children, to monitor the language that you're using um, and ask how you can help. I kind of want to keep going on this topic for a little bit. Um, when it comes to speaking to parents, in addition to speaking them, do you have like resources and stuff that you suggest that they turn to? And how do you avoid like the, you know, parents going home and falling into a Google black hole because that never ends well. And that's very common. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, yes, Google is so hard and I feel like you can find anything that you're looking for on there. Um, and sometimes, yes, it can lead you to places that are very unhelpful. I think some of my, the first things that I recommend to parents are, um, finding ways to connect with the stuttering community. So whether it's through an organization like the National Stuttering Association or through, um, particularly for parents, looking at maybe um, Friends or SAY, which is the Stuttering Association of the Young um, here in the United States, but looking just to get some information about what is stuttering, um, what causes stuttering. A lot of those basic questions, these organizations have great information already out there. Um, and then also, I think it's important to connect with um, people who stutter if they can. So listening to this podcast, I've recommended it several times to parents. Um, listening to other podcasts, there's Stutter Talk is something I recommend to parents. I think the, we don't have, and I'm talking we as a person who doesn't stutter, we don't have the opportunity to listen to a lot of people stutter. There's people who stutter are not featured in our media. And when they are, it's sometimes it's not very positive. Um, and so learn getting used to, it's almost like we're doing our own desensitization. Um, getting used to hearing people stutter, I think is, is an important thing for parents. Listening to people who stutter, who are successful, who are happy with themselves, who have ideas. I mean, I think these are all new concepts if you do not stutter and you don't know anybody who does. Um, and so um, my favorite things to do are, like I said, the stuttering organizations, but then also connecting parents with podcasts, um, I think is, is a way for them also to consume like small, small pieces of information. It's, um, I think if you handed a, a parent, a textbook, I, I don't know, I think it would be really overwhelming, but the nice thing about these organizations, um, I always say, just sign up for the newsletter. Um, it'll come to your email and you'll get like a little piece of information, or maybe there'll be an event that you want to attend. Um, one of the, I guess the blessings of this pandemic is there's so many things happening virtually. So there's so many opportunities that you could jump onto as a parent. Um, but it's just small digestible pieces of information and you'll realize that your child actually isn't the only one, um, that there's a big community that they could be part of the community, um, if they wanted to, but there's, there's a big, a bigger um, community out there than your, your immediate family and your diagnosis. And, um, I think that's really helpful. There, there will always be parents that Google, I, I probably would <laughs> too. Um, and so I, I think that's natural. I think I have a lot of parents who come, um, and have heard all kinds of things or, or, I think the biggest is parents worry, did, did I cause this? Did I, am I, um, we're somehow responsible. And I think there's a lot to unpack there. One of the biggest things is that this is not, if we're, if we're really leaning into this idea that stuttering is communication, that's the way your child talks, then we have to reframe that it's, you didn't cause anything bad. There's not, there's nothing bad going on here. It's just different. And so reframing that experience, but also sharing with them that no, you, you're not responsible. This is the way that your child communicates. And there's things that you can do to support them and make that experience easier, but that you did not cause stuttering. And so, um, a lot of conversations with parents is around, um, demystifying, going through, um, the, the Google references, um, and talking about what, uh, what their questions are as they come up, um, is, is really common, Caitlin.
So I'm wondering, one of my favorite questions to ask anybody who is an SLP, like what drew you to SLP? Because clearly you have a background before this in education. And so kind of what was your path? Um, well, it was a really atypical path. Um, well, I guess I, probably every SLP says that, though. <laughs> I feel like everyone's path is different. Um, so, yes, I was a teacher before, um, and I loved teaching, but I, I realized that I didn't feel like I was making the impact that I wanted to. It's hard when you have a whole classroom. I was really interested in helping students communicate um, themselves so I could see their own I used to teach fourth grade so I could see their identities forming and I was so interested in and in how do you um, how do you self-advocate for yourself how do you get the information that you need how do you make relationships with other people how do you connect with other people and at some point I was introduced I'd never heard of speech pathology um, till I was a teacher, but I was introduced to one of my students had a speech language pathologist outside of school. And I was chatting with her and I thought, I should do this. <laughs> it sounds really interesting. And um, I decided to, uh, after I think I, I taught for another year or so, um, and decided to make the switch. And it's been it's been a great experience. I love, um, I love being able to run my own private practice. I think um, speech language pathology allows you to do so many different things. So many of my classmates work in hospitals and with babies and all these diverse things. And it's a really unique profession in that way. There's so much you can do with it. So I feel very happy that I landed here in the end. You know, uh, Martha, when when I was reading, you know, the, uh, reading about the good work uh, that, 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 that you know that you you know you were doing with children, uh, you know, uh, you know, I had a flashback of when you know when I was a, a, a child, and and you know we're you know we're you know this 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 wasn't that long ago, of course. Of course. But 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 uh, you know, but I remember in in a grade school. I guess it was in, in like a grade one, two, or three. And and the teacher, you, you know, you 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 know, used you know, used to call it the roll call, and each you know, each student you know had to say their name. And so so I remember at at that young age that that you know that I had a, a problem talking. So. When my turn came, you know, uh, you know, I always had, you know, uh, I always had, had 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 trouble saying Greg or Gregory. So, so, uh, you know, I could say my uncle's name. My name is Joe. It's easy to say. However, though, I mean, this, you know, this, you know, this, you know, this, you know, you know, this, you know, you know, this, you know, this exercise was continuous, continuous. But then I realized the more I think about it, this is where my sense of anxiety started. Mm. And so, so like uh, for a child, how, you know, how does the child, I mean, how, you know, how, how would it, the parent uh, uh, see that the child is anxious? Because at such a young age, when I went home, mm. uh, I wouldn't talk about it, right. but I knew it was there. And then whenever the phone rang, I would, have, uh, you know, avoid the phone, avoid social situations, but the anxiety builds and builds and builds. So this is quite the challenge for any, a, a young person or adult because it, it goes, I mean, anxiety, as, as we all know, it, it is also associated with stuttering. Mm -hmm. So how would you work with a parent? Well, and that's so tricky because you're relying on the child to be the reporter. Um, and especially in that case, coming home from school and sharing, I think when we're trying to get a sense of what what is hard about your day what moments are giving you trouble i think remembering that 
it's not so much that the stuttering got, it was that you weren't able to communicate in that moment. So reframing for children, you know, what was tricky about talking today? What was tricky about communicating today? Um, and checking in with them, I think is, is totally fine because you're giving them the opportunity to share um, and the opportunity to give a window into their perspective instead of just sort of assuming. I think sometimes the opposite happens. Parents are so worried. Oh, like they, uh, they can't, you know, speak in front of a crowd. We'll just avoid that situation. So they don't, you know, maybe order for them in a restaurant or something. Um, but, and the child is really fine with that. Who knows? So really checking in with children and making sure that, um, that they feel heard and that there's opportunities for them to describe the moments that are challenging for them. I think also just being an observer, um, letting children communicate, even if it includes stuttering. So if you're um, sitting at a, a holiday dinner and somebody across the table asks your child a, a question and they start to stutter, just remembering that that's how they communicate it and, and let them go for it. Um, but if it looks like it's a situation where they feel really anxious, you could, uh, you could ask them, oh, I, I noticed that you looked really nervous. What was happening for you? And let them sort of be the expert on that moment. I really don't like when the teacher calls on me. I, I worry about it and see if you can brainstorm together what to do. And maybe um, for the teachers, thinking about how can the teacher promote um, in the classroom that that the student who stutters has enough time to say what they need to say, that they are listened to, that stuttering is a difference just like the many other differences in the classroom and, and should be respected. And so it's not just sort of helping the child in that moment, but also foster the environment for differences. And I think that can that could make a big change in a child's life to feel more welcome and included in their learning space. Um, I think as, my hope is that these spaces, so schools, um, family gatherings, that as the world becomes more aware of stuttering, as we get more information, as we hear more people stutter in our media, that these experiences for kids will become smaller and smaller because it won't be as unusual. It won't be as abnormal because it's just a difference that people know about. Um, and I, I think it's going to take a while. So in the interim, we have to support children and, um, and do things like checking in with them about their experiences. But my hope is that meeting them maybe halfway is society in, in improving our interactions with people who stutter. Martha, I, 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 I attended a workshop on the, the weekend, and one of the students referred to, you know, she, you know, she, she said, now, uh, you know, now, you know, now, you know, now, now I'm going to talk about uh, the F word, mm. not in that context, but she <laughs> said, the F word, <laughs> the F word is fluency. Mm. That's what she calls referred to fluency. Is fluency, from your perspective, a bad word, or has it got a bad rap? What what what's your thought? Oh gosh, so I don't think it's a bad word, and it it's a, it's a word that's very important to us as speech language pathologists. I mean, we we call stuttering a fluency disorder. I think it's a very widely used word. I think what's happened is that when when everything is is poised as being in relation to fluency, that it, it gets so much power. Um, and so I think we're trying to figure out now as a profession, and then I think also a society, what is fluency? Are we even all talking about the same thing? And why is it so important? Um, I think those are big 
questions that I think it's it's been worked up over time. Um, as a profession, we've been talking a lot about changing fluency disorders to stuttering. Uh, we're thinking about what messaging we're sending our clients. If we say you have a, stutter, a fluency disorder versus you stutter, what does that mean? Um, I think that there's, I get a lot of um, parents and clients who talk a lot about fluency wanting to be fluent. And I always ask them, what does that look like? What would you be able to do if you were fluent? What wouldn't you do if you were fluent? And I think that kind of changes the conversation because really what people, all people want is to communicate. They all want to be effective communicators. They want to be able to connect with others. They want to be able to go to a job interview. And so fluency, I think it, it, it's sort of a catch-all. It's become like this umbrella term, but really what we're talking about is achieving a, a success in communication. And so I think that's a really important shift that maybe the goal isn't fluency, maybe it's just being able to order a coffee at the coffee shop. Um, and so shifting that it's not how you say things, but your ability to actually say them. Um, but no, I, I think um, I think that it's not productive to be black and white about really anything. So I would never say that fluency is a bad word or a word that we should strike from our um, practice totally. There's something important there. We've been talking about it for I don't know how many years um, before my time. So there's something important there, but I think it's always important to to reflect on why do we use this term? What does it mean to us? And what what should we do with it? Um, and those questions have really spurred a lot of change um, in speech pathology recently. And I think also starting to, to incorporate more understanding that stuttering is more than how you sound. It's the experiences that you have. It's listener reactions. It's how your body feels. And so fluency doesn't really even cover it. It's not really giving us a whole picture of what it's like to be a person who stutters. So I, I think speech pathologists should be reflecting on their own practice of the word fluency of um, what fluency means to them. I think people who stutter could also, if that's a word that's really important to them, reflect on why, what's it doing for you? What do you do with it? Um, but no, I, I don't think we need to, to um, cancel fluency, um, just thinking about our relationship with it. You know, uh, people who, who, who stutter, my, myself, for example, for year, you know, years, you know, years, you know, years, you know, years and years, I had this, this image or this perception of myself because I stuttered. I was damaged good, need to be fixed. You know, how, how, how would you as a speech therapist change the reframe this? Because we're damaged good, we need to be fixed. And, and this, this is a, a challenge for the, person stutters it's it's a huge challenge and i think the first thing that i would want to know is where where does that come from you know when did that feeling start for you where did those thoughts start for you and tracing back um where where you came into that thinking but i think there's we were talking about stigma earlier i think there's a lot of um, belief out there still, a lot of misinformation about what stuttering even is or where does stuttering come from. And when there's misinformation and stigma, it's easy to internalize those feelings. 
Um, and so really education, it's kind of cliche, education is power. Um, talking through what what's even going on, what's going on um, from a neurological perspective, from um, from attention perspective, breaking down what's happening for you, but also kind of coming back to this idea of neurodivergence or just diversity, thinking about um, what if we thought about stuttering as just something that you do differently, the communication, um, something that you communicate differently and start to think about it that way. Um, it's a big shift. And I think that for clients, for kids who, who feel really negatively about themselves, this can take a while. I think um, just allowing them the space to come and share their frustrations about themselves, share the way they feel about themselves, even that can take a while. I think um, providing a space where they feel comfortable to authentically share how they feel is really the first step in making a change. Um, I think something that my clients have found that's really important is connecting with other people who stutter. Um, I always try to share with families resources for them to be able to meet other kids. I think um, a lot of times when kids feel like they're damaged goods or any of those negative feelings, it's because they've never met somebody who stutters or maybe they know about a celebrity, but that feels kind of far in the atmosphere. Um, and so connecting them with somebody who they could talk to um, or or even listen to if, if they're old enough, if they're a teenager, um, is really important and realizing that they're not alone. And that that also helps for them to realize that, hey, I, I kind of like this other kid and they stutter. So I could maybe like have those feelings about myself. Um, and it starts to normalize uh, stuttering for them is just, this is something that me and this person that I met, that's just something we do. And that's something we have in common and it, it takes it takes that edge off of it feeling like I'm the only one I feel horrible about myself or whatever it is um, and helps them to start to feel to feel better. Um, I, th I think those are those are the biggest, but it is it is hard to get out of that mindset. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that if you can find sometimes kids will reference um, social moments at school that are really hard. So teaming up with their teacher to talk about um, what's the teacher's awareness of stuttering. Maybe every time that the kid stutters, the teacher does something like consciously or subconsciously does something. And so addressing the teacher's understanding of stuttering um, under addressing the family's understanding. Uh, maybe it's a co basketball coach, whoever it is, anybody in their environment that might be contributing to the misinformation or stigma that the child feels. Connecting with them to support the child is really important. So it's, there's a lot. And I, I can imagine that that, that that was a really challenging experience. And I know um, for my clients, it's, it's a very hard place to be in, but there are things that we can work on together to feel more positively about themselves. You know, also, Martha, one, you know, you know, one, you know, one other key area I feel is that is associated the stuttering is this is this feeling of of grief and I and I'm not too sure if this grief is is really sort of addressed during therapy or because and so so you know and and I think a lot of and this is Greg O'Grady talking a lot of people sort of aren't, aren't even aware that there, there there is a grief component to it because in one sense that there, there's a sense of loss you know what I mean what if you know and, and so if if someone doesn't wake up or find the support 
this is grief that has to be dealt with before they can actually benefit. Well, what's your thoughts about that? Yes, there's a, a famous audiologist um, who talks a lot about counseling. His name is David Luderman, and he um, talks a lot about grief. And I was listening to a podcast that he did uh, recently, and he said something along the lines of, we're really just doing grief work um, in speech pathology. And it's true. I think when you're thinking about um, a client who stutters, you are supporting them through recognizing that they communicate differently than they expected that they, um, you know, whether if a moment goes badly or, or not as they expected, you're supporting them through the grief of that experience. Um, and so, and then when you think about the parents, you're also helping them grieve the fact that their child communicates differently than they expected. It's not bad, but it's not good either, but it's just taking on acknowledging, um, that the experience is different than what you expected. Um, and so grief is, I would say it's its a bigger part of the field than, than people realize. I think that's true, whether you're working with a child who stutters, whether you're working with a child who can't say there are sound, um, you're managing the difference in, in expectation. I thought my child would do this, but they're doing that. and. It's not that this or that are, is bad or good, it's just different. Um, and so counseling is a, is a huge part of stuttering speech therapy. Um, and I, I often feel like, um, like it is grief work, managing your emotions around how you communicate. Um, but part of grieving is acknowledging and growing from it as well. So acknowledging the, the parts that are challenging, the parts that maybe disappointed you, that felt frustrating, all those different steps of grief that I can't remember right now, um, but coming to this point where that's given you some optimism about the future, um, it's given you a path to go forward. Um, that's the goal of speech therapy is let's process your communication difference. And then let's think about how you can use that to your advantage. That's sort of where we hope to go in therapy is let's get to a place where nobody can stop you. You're a confident and comfortable communicator. Um, but you have to go through that grief process. And I think, um, not so much with your young young kids, but definitely school age kids are grieving the fact that they notice that they're different than their peers. And so they need support figuring out who they are, what this means, and then what to do with it. Um, and so, yes, grief really, res that question really resonated for me, Greg. <laughs> And uh, Martha, do do you feel that the parents themselves, are, I'm not sure they they grieve, but do they realize that they need the support for grief or to recognize it? I think some of them do. I think that when they realize that their child is stuttering or they feel like it's getting worse, they're like in panic mode. They're like, "This is something is different, and we just need to fix it now." And they want their child, everybody wants, I'm speaking as if I have children, I don't, but everybody wants their child to be okay. And so I think parents are largely just trying to figure it out as quickly as they can. Let's fix this thing that we're, we know there's a difference here and we just, we're, we'll make it all better and it, you know, we'll have it go away. And then as the child's in speech therapy or you know, they're having experiences at home over time. I think the parent starts to go through a grieving process. Um, definitely as it, it sort of pairs with their knowledge of stuttering too, because as they learn more about stuttering, they realize, hey, stuttering is going to be variable throughout my child's life. There's going to be times where stuttering comes and goes and there's not, it's, 
There might not be any explanation for it. That's sort of part of the grieving process. There's, there's an acceptance part. Um, there's a frustration part. There's a worry that um, stuttering might hold them back. Um, but as, so as we're working with the child, we're also <laughs> working with the parent. Um, I'll often get emails and go, oh, I think they're just <laughs> feeling a lot of big emotions right now. Um, and making sure that you can provide a space for parents to share, I think, as much as children who stutter feel alone, I think their parents also feel alone. Um, and providing a space for them to talk, to be heard, um, letting them know that what they're going through isn't abnormal. Um, there's a couple of organizations in the United States that provide parent support groups. Um, but looking for parent um, par other parents or other parents of children who have communication differences, maybe um, parents of autistic children or parents of kids that um, have a lisp or whatever it is, just something different um, can be really helpful for parents. We talk a lot about acceptance and the emotional aspects of stuttering on the podcast. So I didn't want to interject because Greg was asking a lot of good questions and you were bringing up a lot of good points. And I think it's really great that we're getting this kind of perspective about younger kids and parents because we mostly talk to adults and people working with adults. So it's really great to get kind of this view of things. Um, I did want to ask kind of a question just out of curiosity. Um, fully unrelated to what we were just talking about. But um, I don't know if it's the same in the United States. So I was kind of wondering, I've noticed here, a lot of people, a lot of SLP students are not interested in fluency. And I don't know if that's the same in the States, but nobody wants to work with stuttering. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, you know, why that might be, or if it's the same, if you see the same thing. I think, so yes, it's something I hear a lot, um, especially on my social media page, um, just connecting with other SLPs. They'll be like, oh, you do stuttering? Wow. You know, like, or they're just, they're so overwhelmed. And I think part of it is that there's a counseling piece. And I think a lot of speech language pathologists are, um, are not sure how to go about counseling. I think counseling is more a part of our field than SLPs realize, but it feels so heightened with people who stutter. I think also stuttering has perhaps bigger emotions than you would process if you're working on R, for example, or um, I don't know what common speech errors you see up there, but I get that all the time in my practice. Um, so that I'm probably going to talk a lot more about emotions and thoughts and experiences in stuttering therapy than I would if I'm drilling a speech sound. Um, and I think that that is something that speech therapists worry about. Um, but I also think there's a big part of speech therapists that think that uh, speech therapy is all about fluency strategies. And I don't think that that's felt good to them. I think that they have had a person who stutters on their caseload. They've done the fluency strategies and the child still stutters and they feel bad about themselves and they don't know how to help. Um, I just, I think that there's a lot of um, SLPs who are not trained beyond fluency strategies and have had bad experiences where they haven't felt effective as a speech therapist. Um, and that's turned them off from working with the population instead of, all right, I'm gonna figure out, kind of like when I was a school-based therapist, okay, I have 12 kids who stutter on my caseload, I have to figure this out, and I have to figure it out in a way that feels good for everybody. Um, a lot of speech therapists, you know, have one kid who stutters a year. 
um, on their caseload if they're a school based. Um, and so, and if you haven't received the training, you just do what you can, but it doesn't really feel very effective or good. Um, so a couple of, a couple of different theories. Um, my hope in, in doing a lot of advocacy, uh, work on my page with speech therapists is that they will feel and see, um, why I think this is one of the most exciting populations to work with. I think you're helping people communicate authentically, um, to be themselves, to make connections with other people. There's something, there's the, the piece that I was talking about, about why I wanted to be a speech language pathologist. I think every speech therapist could be a phenomenal speech therapist to people who stutter. It's acknowledging that, um, that you might need some more training. It's also acknowledging that emotions and thoughts and feelings are part of it. And that's good that it will feel rewarding to you to talk about those things. Um, and feeling, uh, excited about all the opportunities that you have, um, for training. Um, particularly in the U S there's tons of different places, uh, for training. And so, thinking beyond your graduate school classes. But I hope that that's a trend, Caitlin, that will start to change, um, that we can show people how wonderful it is to work with people who stutter. Um, and I, I, my perception is that it is changing, that, um, it's, it's starting to become something that is, uh, more, I don't know, appealing for speech language pathologists. But, um, earlier I was talking about how there's a lot of stigma because we don't get to hear people who stutter regularly in our media. I think similarly, if there were more people who stuttered in the media, like in movies and TV shows, not about stuttering, but just stuttering openly, I think we would also see a lot more speech therapists who felt more comfortable, um, more excited, more, um, knew, knew what to do, um, felt like stuttering was more approachable for them. I think that would make a big change as well. Um, demystifying the population for everybody, I think would be helpful. Absolutely. That's kind of, you know, from my limited exposure to SLP students and SLPs, that's kind of the the vibe that I get. And I mean, a lot of it too, I think from speaking with my classmates, we just took our fluency disorders course last semester is like with things like aphasia, there's a very big counseling aspect there, but you know what caused the speech problem. You know what's happening, but you can't really pin down a, a cause for, for stuttering and it's very unpredictable. And a lot of people don't like that. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think maybe, um, I don't know, shifting from, Ooh, I, we're going to have to do some digging and sleuthing shifting from being like, I don't, that's overwhelming. And I, you know, don't know where to start to like how exciting that I get to figure that out with my client and that we get to work on something together. It's just a, it's a mindset shift. There's a, a, you have to learn, lean into a certain amount of flexibility and be okay with every client is different. Every path is different. Um, but that's ultimately what makes speech therapy exciting. And I think speech therapists would enjoy it. It's just, it's, you're right. It's, it's, there's not a systematic, I progress to this thing and then we do this. Um, but allowing yourself to think outside the box, um, and to be, be flexible and let the client lead. Um, I think ultimately is a pretty rewarding, pretty rewarding path. You know, uh, Margaret, this is one of my, you know, you know, frustrations. As a, as a person who stutters, 
because uh, you know often uh, you know think about the you know, you know, you know, you know Joseph Sheen's study race mm-hmm. for when when you know when he says that ten you know that 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 you know that you know that ten percent of the stutter is a physical component, the tip of the iceberg, whereas you know ninety percent is the lower. But really, for me, and is you know I feel that uh, the the tip of the stutter is one percent, what's below the surface is ninety nine percent. But no one seems to be listening, and it seems like people who stutter are sort of are, are, are losing here because. There's no sufficient or adequate mental health support mm-hmm. for people who study in families. And it seems like either you know, you know, and and you know, like you know, like like as you were saying, the the you know the actual mental health and well-being component of stuttering is so deep and so immense, immense that I think people don't know what to do or what the next steps are, because you know, you know, because I remember first when we were. You know, you know when you know when the Newfoundland Labrador Stuttering Association had had our first conference with people stutter. I actually, you know, you know, I actually contacted the Mental Health Association in Newfoundland to ask if we had a guest speaker. How naive I was to to come speak about the mental health piece of stuttering, and their response was that uh, we, you know, we, you know, we have no no one specialized in that area, and then you know they, you know they. Wished us luck and closed the door, and this is four years ago. Wow! And I think we're still here, but no one really understands. And and you know, as a person who stutters, it's a huge part of the problem. Now, 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 now you know. Now I'm on my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I I get on the soapbox all the time. I, people probably feel the same. There she goes talking about it again. But no, I, I agree with you. The mental health component is is huge and i think that speech therapists are trained in this in the medical model right so we're trained that you have a diagnosis i well i evaluate it i diagnose you i treat you and you head out the door but recently so the last four five years we've been talking about a more social model of disability which is that society is contributing to um to how people feel about their the stuttering and so the really stuttering like we've said is a communication difference but what the challenge is is really the experience of stuttering so um so it would be those all the things below the surface of the iceberg is what's contributing to that difficult experience, but not really the stuttering itself, not the the one percent above. Um, and so I'm hoping that speech therapists and advocating for this in my corner, and I know there's many, many other speech therapists, professors, uh, researchers, um, public speakers who are also talking about we have to address the experience of stuttering in our profession. We have to, um, we have to provide counseling. We have to support mental health. We have to um, address things like toxic positivity and positivity and um, and identity and stigma. These are huge parts of the experience of stuttering, which is what contributes to all of the the hard things that have to do with stuttering. If, if there wasn't, uh, these, um, the misinformation or the stigma, maybe it would feel totally fine to stutter all day long in different communication spheres. Maybe that would be totally fine for a person who stutters, but there's these experiences that they're having that, um, impact them. And so we as speech therapists have to look beyond the stuttering or the F word as we were talking about before and, um, (laughs) and, and address the experience. Um, and that's a huge part of our field that's growing. Um, there is a lot of research about it already. Um, and figuring out ways to implement it at the individual speech therapist with a young client or an adult client level. Um, and so we're, we are growing as a field. I think there's 
amazing speech therapists out there working on the experience of stuttering. And there's some speech therapists that, that don't know about that yet. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but yes, I agree with you. Mental health is so important um, and is becoming a big, a big part of stuttering speech therapy. Well, well, Martha, not, you know, not to take more, you know, more of your time, but this, you know, this, you know, this has been an excellent uh, in, interview. I'm not too sure if Caitlin has has anything else to, to, to say. Um, no more questions, really. I mean, I could ask questions okay. forever, but I, I, we don't all have the time for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think that that was a fantastic interview. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, Martha. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been wonderful. It's been, it's been great to connect with you both and talk about stuttering. And I did just want to say, if you had any questions for us, feel free to ask before we sign off. Uh, well, let's see. I'm always interested. I feel like, is there any... I don't know. Is there any information that you think is important for speech therapists to know? I think, particularly for you, Greg, I, I'm always listening to people who stutter, and I think uh, always asking. I certainly don't want people who stutter to feel like they have to do the work for me. I'm, I'm happy to do my own work and learn about stuttering, but um, is there anything that you feel in listening that... I don't know, resonated for you or that you wanted to, to share? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as, as I mentioned, uh, Martha, I mean, the, you know, 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 the, the mental health aspect of the person who stutter is so important. And so I feel that if, you know, if, if, you know, if, if a speech, in a speech, you know, language pathologist, is working, you know, working with a person who 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 stutters. You know, they you know they you know, they need to recognize, you know, they you know they, you know their comfort level as well. Like when when do you involve the other, you know, in a other healthcare professional like a psychologist, you know, you know, psychiatrist to work as as part of the team. So I think you know I think this this. This, you know, this, you know, this, you know, this may be a disconnect with some of the speech pathologists, not all, but just, you know, just, just, you know, just, you know, it's their couple level. And I think it's, you know, you know, they know they need to know when to reach out to others to support this client as well as the family, you know? Yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, you know, that's a fabulous point. Something that I, I always need to be thinking on. And I think, um, I heard Scott Yaris recently was saying something along these lines that you have to know your own threshold um, and your own capabilities and, and make sure that you know when to refer out um, because really a team approach is the most powerful um, and the speech therapists are, are qualified to do counseling. We um, It's part of our scope, um, but there are other professionals that also counsel um, and provide mental health support. So I, I totally hear what you're saying um, and making sure that, that you know when to refer is really important. So thank you for reminding me to reflect on that. That's, that's helpful for me. <laughs> You know, and Martha, I often wonder if a speech, you know, a speech therapist fully understands the anxiety level of, of a person who stutters. You know, because I mean, the, the anxiety, as you know, can be really severe. So, just just reflect on that as well. You know. Mm. Yeah. Yep. My thought is, I don't think we'll ever know if somebody understands the anxiety levels of anybody else because you can't mm -hmm. understand another person's experience and it goes it's in stuttering it's in everything 
And so mm-hmm. that's that's my little my little add on to the end there. <laughs> it's it's something I've thought about a lot, and it comes up on this podcast a lot. And I've I've always wondered, you know, how I'm going to be empathetic in my practice and be able to understand the level of anxiety that my clients, my future clients would be feeling Mm -hmm. um, and be able to, to understand that. And, and I don't know that I ever could, but on the same end, I don't know that somebody else isn't going to understand how anxious I am about something totally different. And it's, Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it applies across the board. It's, it's a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and also it's very difficult to actually explain what, describe anxiety because it's so different for each person and uh, you know they say that anxiety is associated with the fear like it's the future but just to describe it you know it's hard to put in words at times you know i agree and, and, and so so i think it may help if someone if the slp asks what you know what are you as you mentioned earlier martha just explain just what are you feeling and i think as if, if if a speech therapist can help our, this person sort of articulate that, I think that will help. I think. Yeah. I was thinking that I might not be able, well, I won't be able to, as Caitlin was referencing, be able to understand how somebody feels, but I can provide opportunities for me to listen, for them to share, um, op- for little kids' opportunities Um, whether it's, you know, using visuals so that they can describe how they feel. So um, Mm -hmm. something that speech therapists, we specialize in communication. So maybe you won't be able to share every detail of your anxiety, but let me see if I can provide you with some resources so that you feel successful in sharing how you feel. Um, That's something that I, that I can do. Um, so making sure that um, that you're providing those experiences for listening, um, and that and that children feel, and I always talk about children because I do pediatrics, but adults too feel like they have the resources to describe how they're feeling um, is really mm-hmm. really important. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you. Know, th- thank you again, Mar- uh, Martha. And we, you know, we, you know, we would love to have you back again. Oh, I would love to come back again. This was <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> you were both great to talk to. This has been an episode of Some Stutter Law, Newfoundland, and Labrador's first podcast about communication disorders. Some Stutter Law is hosted and produced by Greg O'Grady, Caitlin Mayo, Dr. Paul D. Decker, Melanie Crane, Emily Murphy, and Luca Dainu. Some Stutter Law is available on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. You can also check out the Some Stutter Law channel on YouTube. To ask a question, send us a comment or suggestion, or just get in touch, find us online at Some Stutter Podcast on Instagram or at Some Stutter Law Pod on Facebook. Thanks for listening. <laughs>